This is Git Minutes episode 44, with another interview from the Git Merge conference in 2017. Josh Triplett is the author of Git series, which is a really cool command line tool for, for, for evolving patch series in Git. Git Minutes is hosted and sponsored by DigitalOcean. You can get $10 of credit by entering the promo code GitMinutes10 after you register your account. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'm now sitting here with uh, Josh Triplett, right? That's right. Uh, you're from Intel, but that's not why you're at Git, uh, at Git Business. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Officially. That's right. Yeah, I've been working on a project that called Git Series to track patch series in Git. This was inspired partly by my own experiences trying to contribute to projects like the Linux kernel and others that require uh, a well-defined patch series that often goes through several rounds of iteration before it's applied that don't tend to work via pull requests but tend to work via mailed patches mm -hmm. and the in the course of developing it i found that it also worked for some of my colleagues and others who had similar problems but the motivating issue was really when you build a patch series, you'll have patch v2, patch v3, patch v4, as you revise the patch series to deal with feedback, and nothing really versions that patch series. All of the individual patches are con contributions to version control and are themselves changes that turn into a commit, but nothing versions the at the meta level of the patch series overall. So when you rebase dash i and use all of Git's powerful tools to manipulate the patch series, reorder, split, combine, change commit messages, write a cover letter for that matter, none of that is tracked in Git at all. So mm -hmm. I built a tool to track that, to version that, and to allow you to uh, commit that and say, here's what I was thinking at each step. I'm incorporating this person's feedback. I'm reordering the series so that it bisects properly whatever you're trying to do. Okay, so uh, let me take a, a step back and uh, and explain this for like the, the common Git users, how they, this would help uh, him or her with, uh, with their problems. So if I un understand it correctly, uh, Let's say I'm, I'm working on a branch, right? And I'm pu publishing this branch to GitHub or whatever, making pull requests and uh, trying to get this uh, work merged into some target repository. Right. And as I am, as I get feedback and reviews, I, I fix up the commits uh, or change them again, rewriting history on this branch. Right, exactly. And, and as I'm now commonly, like, latest greatest right i only care about the, the, exactly uh, and, yeah and, and the target uh, like a maintainer who i'm trying to get to accept my patches they also only care about the end result uh, but uh, the, the the workflow for for working with this especially if i'm collaborating with others who are also have to deal with this history being rewritten exactly on the way, yes i'm gonna have to tell them all the time okay i push forced now you're gonna have to reset hard uh, exactly it's all kind of convention rather than any actual tool assistance mm -hmm. so you know even for your own local purposes, if you uh, accidentally make a change you didn't want to make, or if somebody tells you, uh, I liked the way you did this function in the previous version yeah. of the patch and I don't care for how you revised it, then you're either going to have some fun experiences with Git reflog digging out <laughs> old versions of your patch, which that's transient and not really shareable, yeah. or you might dig the patches out of your outgoing email or out of an email archive. I've done all of those things in the past. Oh, yeah. But on top of that, I think you really nailed it when you're talking about collaboration, that that's the other problem, that we have projects like Linux or projects like Git where there are thousands, tens of thousands of developers who collaborate on a regular basis and the process is designed to scale and work very well with large numbers of collaborators. But I would, I think it's safe to say that the average number of developers for an individual patch series is, a, is about one. Yeah. And very rarely do you collaboratively develop a patch series. You just collaborate by all throwing patches at the central place where people work on it. Sure. So if you want to share work on 
a backport of patches or share work on development of a new subsystem or driver or system call or whatever you're trying to work on, it's difficult to collaborate on the portion of the work that is getting it prepared for upstream. Yeah, yeah. You can collaborate on the code by all means. You could make individual commits and try to collaborate on a small scale, but the model doesn't really scale down there simply because you don't get to share the results of a rebase-i without out-of-band coordination. Mm. So, yeah, as a main, from a maintainer perspective, I imagine it's also nice uh, when people are pushing me new branches that have been fixed up, uh, that it's easy for me to see what is different now from the last time they pushed. Uh, exactly, yes. If, um, if your upstream doesn't care about Git series at all, then they don't have to know that you're using it. You can simply send patches or pull requests as you normally would. But you can also say, here is a branch that shows you the history of my history. Here is the uh, the commit messages as you go. So when you normally say, you know, patch v3, here are the changes since patch v2, that's the other thing this, this will help you with is giving you the the patch meta change log for how you've changed the series and making it easy for you to put that into your next please apply these patches mail. So uh, let, let's talk about like concretely what what exists right now like as Git series. Sure. So it is uh, an implementation. Yes. Uh, it is a Git, uh, or would you call it an extension? Is that the... Uh, in a way, it? yeah. It's... Uh, Using st the standard trick that anything named git dash something will be run when you invoke it via git. So it's a tool designed to interoperate with a git repository. It itself has a stack of subcommands, so you can start a series with a given name. You can uh, set where you want the baseline of that series to be and where the current version is. You can add, it, add, add and edit a cover letter, and then you can commit changes to the series. So that creates a separate family of branches in a separate namespace. So normally you'll have uh, a set of standard branches like master, random feature, you know, remotes like origin, yeah. but you'll also, now you'll also have a set of Git series branches that are named based off of whatever name you give the series. Okay. And those branches will separately track your meta history for how you've changed a patch series over time. Mm -hmm. And then when you're ready to share such a series, you can e you can push and pull the current version as however you like, but you could also push and pull the series branch and manipulate that if you want. But the most important thing that people use right now is that you can git series format to turn to give you the equivalent of git format patch, mm -hmm. but notably you don't have to tell it my patch series starts here. With pa format patch, you'll normally say format 12 patches or with a cover letter and then let me write that yeah. or format from this hash you, the git series always knows what your series is so you can just say format it please oh. and along the same lines you can git series rebase dash i you don't have to say the last 10 commits it will simply uh -huh. assume you want to rebase the whole series and it will immediately pop up the rebase dash i editor Man, that's a good uh, good one i mean that's uh, so many times that I've like, like looked at uh, my local Git log before I do a rebase. Exactly. Side. Yeah. Git standard workflow for me was Git log and then you know double click and paste the hash uh, for where I want to start. Yeah. Or you and, just do like uh, tilde twenty or something. Yes. That's exactly. exactly. Either enough. count it or copy a hash, one or the other. But either way, it's. Uh, even if you don't care about any of the other versioning features, you can use that aspect of Git series as a convenience mechanism just to allow you to easily track where your patch series is mm. and what it consists of. So jumping back, I want to jump back a bit to, to uh, uh, somebody wants to try out uh, Git series because um, they recognize that uh, this is, is, these are problems that they have and they, they want to try it out. Sure. Uh, so how do they go about it? So if you go to the Git series homepage, it's currently hosted on GitHub. You can go to github.com slash git series slash git series. Okay. And it, uh, it's written entirely in Rust and packaged using the Rust package management system called Cargo. So the, there's a readme available on GitHub, but all you normally need to do to install it is install Rust and Cargo, which there's a standard installer for that if your distribution doesn't already have it packaged, mm. and then run cargo install git series. Okay. That will put it uh, in a directory that you can put on your path, and it, uh, there's also a man page available that you can install somewhere readable. Yeah. 
but it's uh, as far as getting started, there's a guide in the README as well as information in the man page for how the commands work. And in particular in the README, there is a walkthrough of suppose you want to do this workflow, here's the commands you would run and here's how that would work and how that changes the tree. Oh, that's great. The uh, other piece of documentation I consider to be fairly important is it, that's what you need if you want to get started with Git series, but the other is that I consider the data model at least as important as the tool itself because I want to make sure people are able to use this data and extract this data later if it turns out this isn't the right front end for people to be using. Okay. So uh, in that spirit, I've also got an extensive internals documentation that says exactly how your data is stored and what the... Uh, the storage format and layout of the repository is, just so that if you want to build, say, a graphical tool that can browse this or add support for it in a web front end, for example, then that would tell you everything you need to know there. I mean, I imagine that uh, review tools uh, could use this. For example, internally. yeah. And they, I would they, love to see this integrated with something like Garrett or with GitHub reviews or similar. I know yeah. I've had many people tell me that GitHub pull requests have fairly poor tracking of when you do a force push to, because you've rebased. Yeah. That the old version is still technically available, but the UI doesn't give you a very easy way to find out what changed from the old version to the new version. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, I talked earlier about uh, Johannes uh, uh, or with Johannes about this uh, um, these uh, ideas or plans uh, that you've thought about uh, how to make uh, reviews uh, like have a more of a kind of a cross tool uh, standard format for how these things can be exchanged. Is is this this data model or is that a more like a patch format that includes review? I think it's a bit of both, really, that the you need a format for storing the reviews within the scope of a Git repository so that you can distribute them. That's what helps a review system be more decentralized and more capable of saying, here is my review commentary. Mm. So for that, you need something similar to the Git series data model to tell you what the stack of patches is, the cover letter, and so on. And then you need some manner of attached either notes or comments that allow you to say this line of the change, not just this line of the code, but this line of the patch, you know, this hunk or this part of the commit message or cover letter. Here is some commentary attached to that, either making a comment or more commonly requesting a change. Mm -hmm. And then you need a way to address each of those and say, okay, I believe I'm responding to this and I've made a change in the new patch that addresses that so that it no longer applies. Almost a, a micro issue tracker for yeah. here's the 12 things wrong with this patch. Well, I've fixed all 12, not just 11 and missed one. And the data model needs to store that as well as have an interchange format for that that can go over things like email and not just a git push. So ideally, once you've done a review, you should be able to submit it to something like Garrett or similar and have it show up in a web UI. But you should also be able to just say, you know, get format review, for example, yeah. and get a mail that you can send complete with an in reply to to the patch that looks just like if you would opened it up in Mutt and hit reply and replied in line to the patch. This, this sounds really powerful. I mean, and, and it like I told you, Hannes, if we had a format like that, it could also be independent of version control system. It would be, uh, or, or it could be. I mean, if it's stored inside a repository, it would, of course, be uh, uh, Git in, in, in this particular case. Um, but how, how do we uh, go forward now? Like, what was the discussion yesterday at the, at the summit? Um, what are the next steps? So I think there's a few different directions that this can be taken. Uh, the two biggest open items right now are improving the data model within core Git and improving the review functionality. So talking about those a bit separately, in terms of the the model within Git itself, my original goal with Git series was to build something that one person can use or one group of people can use on a larger project without convincing the whole project to switch. So because of that, it had to work with stock Git. Mm -hmm. It had to generate data that would feed through stock Git. And based off of that, I built its data model around those constraints. So it plays some interesting tricks with uh, Git links, which is the underlying machine 
machinery of submodule, and hopefully I didn't just make a bunch of potential users run away screaming. <laughs> but uh, it uses that in a completely different way from submodules to track the base and series of a commit. But it has to pull some stunts to keep those reachable all the time. And I gave a presentation about this at uh, Linux Plumbers Conference mid -last, late last year. And uh, Junio happened to come to that conference, and we ended up chatting about it afterwards and what the data model looked like and how we could improve the user experience. And he was actually quite willing, based off of seeing this use case and seeing the proof of concept, that he would be willing to change the data model of Git to better accommodate this, not add the full functionality of it, but more add the underlying machinery that would make it possible. Mm. And so so with a couple of minor changes to get that will require a few, um, a couple of changes that will require stepping the format forward and allowing new things to appear inside a tree along the same lines of the level of work that was done when submodules were first introduced, okay. then we could introduce a new type of tree entry yeah, that can right. track a commit. And those... Uh, those mechanisms would be usable for Git series to track the base and series of a patch, a set of patches, but it would also allow things like the Software Heritage Project, which is kind of archive.org for software, okay. to track things like here is the set of refs for a repository we've archived, here's what they are tomorrow, and some one of them may have been force pushed, but we want to archive the older version for uh, the same reasons that archive.org remembers the versions pre and post edit of every random web page so you don't get to take information back. Hmm. <laughs> so they would really like a data model for storing that. Right now they do it versioning in a database, but yeah. keeping it natively in Git would have a lot of advantages, not least of which using Git itself to mirror and replicate it. And there's a lot of other potential applications for that kind of thing as well. So it's a simple data format change that has a lot of possibilities, including enabling Git series. So that's one direction, and that's the biggest thing I'm planning on focusing on myself in the near future. I'm hoping to get that developed over the next uh, month or two and get that into upstream Git. Mm. The other significant change would be integrating this with review formats. For that, I know that there is a, an effort underway to add a format, I believe it's called ReviewDB or similar, that is a new data model underlying Garrett so okay. that Garrett's storage format would be well-specified and standardized and usable for interchange. And then other review tools could use either that or a similar format. I don't know to what extent they're working with other developers of review tools to make sure it will fit all of the use cases, but hopefully a standard format will arise there that we can use for storage of this data within Git. And above and beyond that, someone would need to develop an interchange format for sending that over email or similar so that you don't just push and pull it to review tools. But if a format like that arises, I would be quite excited to integrate that into Git series and have support for having reviews attached to versions of patch series and having versions of patch series address items that were requested in reviews. And I think the two are a natural fit that the point of review is to encourage revision of a patch and this Git series is all about tracking the revisions of patches. So I think those go hand in hand. It, um, I also have to think a bit about uh, Johannes before talked about this uh, this uh, uh, public inbox that kind of tracks uh, the mail right, yeah. the, the mailing list activity, uh, which is also a, a Git repository. It is, yeah. And and in a way, the many of the mails or most of the mails, I guess, are also a patch series uh, in a in a Git repository. <laughs> in a way, yes. Uh, I'm actually really excited about public inbox as a replacement for tools like uh, Gmain, for example, which yeah. had gone defunct, yeah. and I think that was one of the major motivations that, you know. At the time, NNTP and news formats seemed like a natural fit for mail archives, and I think what Gmain did made a lot of sense. But news formats and NNTP have really, you know, apart from the enthusiasts that continue to support them, they're not necessarily the lingua franca that they used to be. No. And in the meantime, Git is increasingly that. So using that as a storage format that allows mirroring it in many places, you know, 
Gmain, there weren't necessarily a large number of people that did a news level mirror of the whole archive because it's expensive to do. It's a lot easier to do that with a Git repository, or at least do it for the subset that you care about for a handful of mailing lists. Mm. I think that would be really useful, and as a, a mechanism for sharing and working with those uh, archives, I think that's quite helpful. Yeah. But that covers public inbox from the perspective of being a mail archive, but it's also useful for giving a more canonical name to messages, that message IDs are not as unique as they should be, that one message to several lists with several different footers and trailers and details may have the same message ID, even assuming a lack of any malice involved. So having a hash you can point to as a unique URL and say this is where the mail is, this is the canonical identifier of a mail, is really useful useful if you want to reference a mail discussion as part of a review. Yeah. So I think that fits naturally with some of these review formats as well, that if you're sending feedback via email, you really want to keep a record of, hey, I did revisions based off of the feedback from this mail, or I sent responses to you know, I did a format review and sent that in as a mail and it's recorded here and when I incorporated that. So I think that fits in as a component of where do we get these mails from, where do we archive them at. And uh, that helps as well for some things don't fit in the, t the context of a review. Some things really are an email discussion. Here's the 20, ser 20 uh, mail thread where we discussed the architecture of this patch. And that doesn't fit into a review system. That just is a relevant discussion that would be good to cite for information. You should still summarize the discussion, say this is the architecture we ended up with. But the discussion can be really helpful if you want to know all the roads not traveled, for example. But apart from that, I think the, uh, there's a difference between a structured review and unstructured email. And trying to impose more structure onto email to turn it into a, a review may or may not be successful, although I think there's some good possibilities there. But I think at the very minimum, it is extremely useful as a archival reference for every individual email and an ability to link to those mails and say this is where this information came from and where we discussed it. Mm -hmm. I mean, at my company, we have like a bit of a uh, rusty, uh, I don't mean the, the programming language sense, but uh, a, a crappy old review system. Uh, okay. But still, that is where the most, most of the sort of knowledge and uh, explicit knowledge about the code uh, goes. People are not so good at taking stuff that gets discussed in the in the review and bringing it into the commit message. Absolutely. And, and yeah, that makes sense. And I'm I'm afraid that later on, if we you know change this review tool with something more modern or something better, um, that we're going to lose. I mean, we're going to have to keep it running so people can go and uh, and and look right. back and find the old discussions again. Uh, and Migrating data turns out to be a very challenging problem, even more so than moving to a new yeah. tool that all that old data is so valuable. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. That's I'm not. I think we're probably not even going to try. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Migrating it, it's that, that's going to be real tough. Uh, but I, I also told uh, some colleagues, you know, why don't you just copy and paste the whole thing into the commit message? It's not like it's going to make the size of the, of the repository explode if you just include some paragraphs of text from the review. Right. It's, it's, it doesn't hurt to have it there. Sure. And there's a balance there between having the log be reasonably usable and having all of that information archived. But often those discussions have some key insights into why the software is the way it is. And I've seen mailing list discussions copied into documentation, into commit messages, even into code comments before, yeah. just saying this is why this works this way exactly. or why it doesn't work this other way. And I, I've especially, I, there's a memorable comment, I need to dig it up so that I can keep a link to it around somewhere in a project saying, uh, you know, here is the here are the reasons why you shouldn't try to change this function to work this other way that you would think is better. Uh, <laughs> after you've made an attempt and ended up reverting it because it doesn't work, then please increment yeah, the following yeah. number, number of poor suckers, you know, 18, whatever, 19. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of thing is the institutional memory of a project that that is not always recorded in its source code or in its reviews or in its, you know, even with Git series, 
I'm trying to record more of the interesting history of where things went, but it'll never be a, you know, a perfect record of everything people were doing and thinking and talking about at the time. It's just a better approximation of, hey, can we remember a little bit more of the history for how we got where we are? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're never going to be able to keep all the water cooler talk exactly. uh, that happened about uh, everything. And every in some cases, we, some cases, we may not want to. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, do you imagine like this kind of archive uh, that it, it is a part of the repository itself or are they somehow just linked by references? Uh, I feel like eventually what I would love to have is if people were to yes, adopt yeah. Git series wholeheartedly, I would hope to still have uh, projects rely on having a... Um, a not, not a linear, but a kind of curated history where I still think there's value in the Git style curated revisionist history approach of this is how we wanted to have done it step by step. Mm -hmm. It makes things bisectable. It makes everything happen in logical changes. But I do hope that the series are you know, posted and archived in some manner of issue tracker or pull request system or review tool such that the history of how those patch series are developed is still available somehow. Whether it's linked in the commit message of the final merge saying here's where it was developed or whether it's just available in issue number 407 of some subsequent future version of GitHub or Garrett that uh, supports Git series and review formats. Whatever the mechanism, I don't want that history to get lost. And I frequently do find myself digging back yeah. through, you know, five-year-old, ten-year-old mailing list discussions to find what were people talking about yeah, to yeah, get yeah. this the way it is, mm -hmm. especially if you're thinking to question those decisions and revisit yeah. them. You want to know what people were thinking about when they made that decision. So I hope that that information continues to be archived and I want to provide good interchange formats for, if no other reason than that, if we have a good interchange format, then even if we develop a new tool or several new generations of tools, we shouldn't have to do a flag day migration or keep the old tool running or risk losing all this institutional memory. Mm -hmm. We should be able to migrate the data across, including the history of our history and all of our revisions to it, and keep all of that, whether, you know, if in 10 years we're using Git series or some other review tool or some built-in functionality of Git or some exciting new version control system that replaced Git, who knows? Whatever we're using, I hope it still reads and interoperates with the Git series data model format or has a translator for that format so that you don't lose all of that old valuable history. That is a, a great uh, vision. I really hope hope we get that. Um, is is there any sort of help uh, or uh, call to action that you would say, like to the community, uh, be sure, it near uh, from everywhere from uh, the, the uh, contributors in Git itself to companies who are around Git vendors and or users. Absolutely, sure. So I would say there's kind of two major calls to action there. One is that if you're a developer or contributor, there are a number of tasks around yeah, Git series that I've tracked in the GitHub issue tracker of varying levels of difficulty. There's some intro level easy projects that I'm more than happy to mentor people getting started on as well as much larger projects like come up with an architecture and model for merging two sets of changes to a patch series. I did a rebase, you did a rebase, how do we reconcile this? Uh, so ranging wildly in difficulty, but I'm happy to work with people who want to contribute and there's a lot of well-defined tasks to go. So on the other hand, even just as a user, I would be quite happy to have people just try the tool out, play with it, use it in practice to do some of their development, and tell me anything you run into that doesn't fit your use case. Does it do what you want? Does it not do what you want? Did you have to write scripts or customization to make it fit your workflow? Everybody has a different Git workflow. Some of them have many things in common. Some of them are wildly different. I intentionally don't want to handle every workflow in the world. It's not a wildly opinionated tool, but it is one that assumes a certain development process and model of let me curate some history until I get what needs to be applied to the main trunk. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, 
if it doesn't, if it feels like it should work, but it doesn't quite fit, or there's a missing tool or a missing option to do what you want, let me know, file an issue, you know, ask me if there's some way it could solve the problem. Maybe it should change. Maybe there's some new insight to make it better. Or maybe there's some existing functionality that I'm not exposing with a name that immediately connects with it to people. Yeah. You know, it made sense in my head, but then I wrote the thing. <laughs> yeah. So I'm happy to just have users providing feedback that tells me this is how it could make my life easier. This is how it could save me, you know, five minutes per day times all the days I do development. Mm. That makes me happy. Do you have any uh, other place on uh, GitHub issues where people can reach you if they want to help out? Uh, apart from GitHub issues, I'm quite happy to have people chat with me via email. Uh, I don't mind having private email conversations. If somebody isn't wanting to have a discussion in public, maybe they have some interesting use case at their company that they don't want to expose all the details of their development process in order to ask a question. Yep. And on top of that, for the underlying data model, I think that uh, people have been reasonably willing to use the Git mailing list to describe such use cases as well. We've okay. had several good discussions about Git series on the Git mailing list. And as the data model gets better integrated into core Git, then I suspect that people will be more interested in having those conversations on the Git mailing list itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, is there anything more that you want to share about the conference or uh, anything like that? Uh, definitely enjoying the conference. I've never been to uh, to Git Merge before. I had uh, come here because, specifically because it was uh, right next to FOSDEM, and I was coming and presenting to FOSDEM. And I thought, you know, why don't I stay a couple extra days and participate in Git Merge, talk to a lot of interesting people. Really enjoyed the Contributors Summit yesterday and enjoying the conference today. And uh, apart from that, uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Yeah, thank you very much for talking with me, Josh. No problem. And that's it for this episode. It was a long time in the making, almost a year now since uh, I talked to Josh and the other uh, good people at uh, Git Merge 2017. As you may have noticed, we've kind of been doubling off with the activity on Git Minutes in the last uh, years. Uh, this uh, Git Merge conference was the last burst of uh, material that uh, I, I, I got together from um, the attendees there who were kind enough to, to take time out of their conference and, uh, and spend it on recording with me. And I, I feel really bad about not getting around to getting these episodes out sooner. There still are a few more left. Um, that I want to get out there. And uh, even though it might be that uh, the material is already a year out of date, um, I hope some of it is still valid. And uh, at least I'm going to get it out there until I, I finally <laughs> give up on producing more Gitman's episode. Because uh, I kind of come to a place in in my career where I have too little to do with uh, with Git um, professionally, at least at the deeper level. And just life work balance and balance doesn't leave enough uh, time left for producing a podcast. As I'm sure you most of you know, <laughs> it does take some time out of the day. So anyhow, you can find the episode for this episode. Uh, you can find the show notes on links at Git Minutes dot com slash 44 and uh, i want to thank everybody who's been supporting the show including digital ocean once again you can use the promo code to get minutes one zero and uh, you'll get ten dollars of credit and and support the show if you sign up there you can send me any feedback or comments on under the show notes or send me an email on feedback at get minutes dot com and yeah if you want to uh, subscribe, you can go to gitminutes.com and see an archive of all the episodes from the past. And until next time, thank you for listening.